Arrived at 
system would be 1.4 million dollars. 
research every case of missing persons that vanishes in the wild. The cases must fit a narrowly defined profile which has been refined after years of research under profile points. The disappearance does not match the profile. We don't look into it. We are not implying that all of the cases in this book are all cases in Canada that match the profile. Quite the contrary. This book does constitute nine years of research. Sixty plus cases in this book are new and do not appear in any missing 411 books. When you read the stories, think about the SAR workers that have volunteered their time for searching for others. The vast majority of search and rescue workers are volunteers, and they get their credentials on their own time with their own money. Without search and rescue volunteers, the vast majority of missing people would never be found. And I want to personally thank all of them for their time in helping others. And for that, you have my gratitude. So, what's this profile he's talking about? He looks at missing uh, person cases, but not all of them. Why is that? Well, very briefly, I'll tell you right now. Um, this man, David Politis was on this, I don't actually know the full details, but he was on this big 
was lying on it. Nobody could explain the perplexing scenario. In Missing 411, a sobering coincidence, I presented several cases where remote vehicles, divers, etc. had searched a body of water. The victim was found precisely where the searchers had just left. Many readers have stated that it appears the victim has been placed there to be located. In the past few years, we have been told by other researchers that they think people think the people were dropped into the place to be found. Nobody ever observes the victims arriving into the area. How the victims got into the space where they are eventually Documented in the books that are found in boulder fields among 
and witness 
Jared Adaradero's name on a list of deadly mountain lion attacks. That's a lie. Watch his first documentary. Missing 411. Four different mountain lion experts wrote that that was not a mountain lion. I've met, read many online forums where people who have never read my book or watched a few of my videos are convinced that a majority of the disappearances were documented are caused by predation. No. Criminal activity. Crime on a mountain trail is friggin' rare. <laughs> but it does happen. If there's evidence of a crime occurred, that's not in here. So just take that in. The things I'm talking about has nothing to do with wild animals. No crimes, no mental health issues, no like none of these things. And he will only pick the most specific cases really make you think, what? And he does a lot of research on them. So consider that when you're hearing some of these, because then you gotta be like, well, wait, you know, if it fits the profile, then like, that, that, that's questionable, you know? And so, this little, not little, but and so this Bigfoot enthusiast, and you know, he's got a lot of great experience here to be able to research all this stuff in person. Documented it for us all. You know, I I'm excited to get into this with you guys. And again, if you like these, we'll do more of the provinces. But maps are uh, also an expensive item for authors to include in books. Forty percent of these, forty percent of this book is disappearances in BC. <laughs> um, I thought it would be prudent to include a map. Study this map. We're not talking about BC today. So let's kind of just get into the actual province info now. So now that you know that, he's done so much research around these. This is why he's doing it. Um, there are a lot of missing cases in um, national parks and all that stuff, each province has. And we're going to talk about them. And we're going to talk about all the weird things that may or may not have gone on in the comments below. I do want to know another cases because the weird ones is like, and it might not be the ones we're talking about today, but he'll have all those profile points. So it's like a case he was going to talk about because like wasn't obviously an animal, wasn't any of these things. The person died in a pool of water, but the cause of death was not drowning. 
news of this incident until later in July of 1974. Robert Comeau had surfaced 200 miles south of Moncton in another country. The incident is described in the July 20th edition of the Lebanon Daily News. Last Saturday, Comeau walked into the St. John's Catholic Church and told Reverend Jack O'Hare that he didn't know who he was or where he was from. Jack O'Hare called the police and Comau was taken to the Eastern Main Medical Center where he had went under testing. The case had broke Thursday when Bangor police received a call, a call from Comau's wife, Annette. Her description of her husband down to small marks and a scar matched the man without a name. Detectives had said the man was using the last name of Komau and a possible first name of Bob, but he knew little else about himself. Interesting. Yeah. Annette had read a story about a man in Bangor who had amnesia and called the police to see if it was Robert. Robert had told the police that he'd walked around for two weeks going to a local library and looking to a newspaper to try and determine who he was. He stated that he'd found $80 in his pocket, but no wallet or other papers. On July 20th, Annette arrived at the Eastern Maid Medical Center and met with Robert. She stated that he didn't remember her or their children, but was happy to be with someone who loved him. Detectives later noted Robert recognized items about his history and politics, but nothing about his personal life. The first issue I considered was how Robert crossed the border into the United States without a passport. He was found without a wallet or paperwork, and he would not have been allowed into the United States without any identification. Bangor police and the United States Customs never commented about this part of the story, and I could not locate any more details about his life after he'd returned with an act to Moncton. That's an odd one. Comment your thoughts below, because, um, Yeah. <laughs> 
August of 2018 and he did state he remembered a trucker saying they were in Utah. He also stated that he might have remembered trying to get a phone from his car. Doctors theorized that he may have suffered a head injury on the slopes, but he is now back on full duty. In many of these cases, the victims have severe head trauma. It is fascinating that Danny claimed to have had head trauma and even had a helmet with him. The incident had international press, yet no one ever came forward, claiming to have given him a ride. The disappearance of Robert Comau and Danny have several similarities in both men. Canadian were found in the United States. I mean, obviously the firefighters did friend. But Danny was located... 39,000 miles, or 1,100 miles, from where he'd vanished, on the opposite side of the continent. It is peculiar that each man cannot remember details from the trip where they disappeared, or to where they were found, a consistent part of each story. Both men were in their 40s, with wife and children. There have been too many cases that have been researched that have familiar themes, memory loss, lengthy travels without memory loss, and credible people is the case too. So something very unusual would have had to have happened. Thoughts below on that one. Now, I think we're getting into our last missing case of New Brunswick. Sloan. He went missing September 17th of 2006. He was 26 years old at the time. This incident had occurred at the far northeastern area of Canada, 30 miles of the Bay of Fundy at the Atlantic Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Matthew Stephen Sloan was a well-rounded young man involved in sports and community. He had a degree in kinesiology from the University of New Brunswick and followed that by attending his educational program at the University of Maine. Throughout his years in school, Matthew had played and coached sports. He committed several summers to Fredericton District Soccer Association, where he coached a summer soccer camp. After his formal education, Matt went on to teach at Nashwakis Middle School, Leo Hayes High School, and Bliss Carmen Middle School. Don't lie. On September 17th of 2006, he had went to the Harvest Jazz and Blues Festival in Frederick. His exact activities throughout the day are vague. Either late at night on the 17th or early the following morning, he had disappeared. There was a search that looked at the St. John River and the surrounding neighborhoods. Search dogs and ground personnel found nothing to point in any direction. In the early morning hours of September 23rd, young lady crossing the Thorpe walking bridge saw something unusual in the water. She called the police and they'd recovered his body. And very few details are available about the condition of it. The coroner in the Frederick in Fredericton did an analysis and came to a unusual conclusion. They could not comment. They could not determine the cause of death. This is a conclusion reached in several cases I have highlighted. This means Matthew did not drown, he was not assaulted, and that there was no toxicology mentioned in any testing. What an odd thing. So he's found in the river, but no water in his lungs, no anything like that that would have caused his death. You really don't know. 
edition of the Gesche Snatty Gazette has details of points of separation, so Gramley told the police last Friday that he and Miss Abraham had split up and taken different routes to a campsite occupied by another team of diggers. The last he saw her was she was climbing the face of the mountain to go across the top. to 
Idris can be in
confirmed that it appeared he had took two firearms when he left his truck, one being a shotgun. The family and RCMP couldn't understand why he would have taken the road that the truck was found. He had been to the camp several times, was not suffering mental illnesses, and they described him as extremely fit and smart. Weather did not did in him in some of the search efforts. As October 2011, um, a Cormorant helicopter from the 103 Search and Rescue Squadron from Wing 9 Wagner was helping with the search. And well, air left the police dog unit into the area once the weather was permitting. William's relatives confirmed that it appeared he had took two firearms. Mm -hmm. They described him as extremely fit and smart. Weather did inhibit some of the search effort. In October, yeah, a Coromund helicopter from the 103 Search and Rescue Squadron from Wing 9 Wagner is also helping with the search and will airlift the police dog unit into the area once the weather permits. The week-long search for the 65-year-old from Indiana has been scaled back earlier this week because no sign of him has been found. Several canine units were taken to the scene, and none of the dog units were able to find William. Numerous helicopters over flight did not find him. Two separate searches started and stopped from these weather issues. And in late October, the final searches were per were terminated, and nothing was found. It's been many years now, and William has not been found. That's really sad. His uh, son and daughter also got emergency passports after they stopped the searches, so that they could go and look, but sadly, nothing was found. So those were the Newfoundland one missing cases. So we're moving on and finishing now with Nova Scotia. So there's four cases, the first being the son of John Henderson. He was a four-year-old when he had disappeared. A Halifax paper made mention of the fact that the son of John Henderson had disappeared from a rural family residence. The four-year-old was lost in the woods and not located until the following Wednesday. The article stated that the 400, that 400 people were searching for the boy, but it was the boy's father and servant who had found him while they were walking through the woods, and the boy recognized the servant. Oh, okay. Just to be clear, this was November 21st of 1826. I was confused for a second. An article in the Indiana Journal following the description of what happened uh, when the boy was found. The little wanderer recognized the servant man and explained, will you not take me to mama? The 
Bible College High School students, over 1,000. 
RCMP reopening this case and handling it as a cold case is fascinating. Every document for them regarding this incident claimed that it was drowning. After the case was reopened, they still claimed it. Why did they have a cold case team investigate the disappearance if they were positive about the findings? Howard Newell's relatives believe the child was very smart. His sibling's statement was that there would be no foul play suspected in this disappearance. The area around the deer stand was described as boggy. It was also stated that this area was not heavily hunted, and it was doubtful that anyone in the area was in the area when he had vanished. Hopefully his family gets some sort of closure. Nova Scotian case is that of 30-year-old Marty Ledger, who left his home May 29, 2014, and traveled north to a remote region of Waverly. He drove out Spider Lake Road and parked at the dead end. At six feet tall and 260 pounds, he was a large man. He had gotten out his mountain bike and had rode off into the bush. He told his friends when he left at noon that he'd be back by 4 p.m. But when he hadn't returned, his family drove out to sight, found his vehicle, and reported him as missing at 8.30 p.m. This area is a combination of extremely thick bush, swamps, and lakes that are marked by a one hour and two hour circular path. On the 30th, the RCMP organized their search and started to deploy resources. One of the biggest searches in the no history of Nova Scotia was then put into motion. Three helicopters, 450 searchers, boats, planes, dogs, everything thrown into the efforts to find Marty. He said, the ground search covered more than 60 square kilometers and a number of helicopters have gone over the lakes, which are remarkably clear because of dry weather. Search dogs scoured the areas and helicopters equipped with thermal imaging technologies also had failed and helicopters would be brought back to site at some point. One helicopter pilot said to a reporter it was the largest search he'd ever seen in his life. Even the Canadian military sent 200 soldiers to train and search. At the end of five days, one of the lead searchers stated that the extreme heat of nearly 90 degrees had exhausted the searchers and dogs. This is an unusual high heat for that part of the world. After a huge effort, search coordinators terminated everything to locate Marty. They had found nothing in relation to his disappearance. Sometimes it's difficult to understand how a body the size of Marty's can go missing. If you couple it with the bike, it makes not finding anything extremely puzzling. If the bike is anywhere in the sun, it absorbs the heat 